so well the initial question is um what is so in our everyday lives and of, and also through philosophy most of us most of the questions we would ask are usually the more substantial so the nature of truth what can we know and meaning of life and so things of that sort where do where do we face the question or the mystery of nothing you know news used as a noun you know like you know what do you think um well uh if we if it really is it does seem to be functioning of the noun often. Yeah, it looks like it's functioning of the noun. Uh, so I think there's a kind of a big scale way it happens and there's a kind of a small. In the Abrahamic religions, right away um, in Genesis, you have um, uh, one story of creation where it's a creation out of nothing. Uh, that was That was not... There's another creation story to go deeper in, where, and that's the more usual one. Well, with some sort of uh, amorphous stuff that was shaped into something, maybe it was water or something. Uh, and um, the Christians were notorious uh, for adopting the out of nothing answer. Um, and so um, that was like one of the surprising things that they were supposed to defend. Uh, and, and it was like a paradigm of irrationality. Uh, and, and why the Christians quickly earned a reputation as irrational. Uh, they did other things to the court. There's a, 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 a doctrine of the Trinity. <laughs> mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> uh, we thought we said strange things and look what you guys do. <laughs> uh, but if, but it is, I think there is an interesting, when you think about that, there's a kind of, uh, why is there something rather than nothing? And there it looks like you have pictured an alternative um, that just being absolutely nothing at all. So you look around and uh, the, you know, the, my, my spectacles need not have existed. They're just contingent things. And, and I, you know, I nearly didn't exist. It was a close call. <laughs> you know, the chance that that particular sperm and egg got together was very, wow, you know, uh, I'm like, a, I will, that's a lottery win right there. I feel pretty <laughs> happy about, wow, I'm in, you know, I'm so much better than all those non-existent people. That's sort of the feeling. <laughs> Richard Dawkins is Sinelli, who is such a severe critic of the Christians. You know, he, he has this whole, he has this passage where he's talking about, we're all going to die. And therefore we are the lucky ones because most people don't even get to die because they don't get to the never born. Uh, just a teeny tiny little fraction, the lucky few get to die. And that passage, I think it's from Unweaving the Rainbow. It's, right, it's a few pages in. It's been read out in secular uh, funerals and uh, people find it very moving. Um, but, you know, then, you know, you get out of the funeral and start thinking about, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> Are there really that many non-existent people? <laughs> and in what is, are there people? Are there people that are, like, what does it mean? Yeah, so you're comparing yourself to your non-existent siblings as you were, you edged them out, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Wait a minute, are there really these things, non-existent people, you know? And then you think, well, maybe that consolation that he's offering is incoherent. Despite him making such fun of religious people, he's doing it himself. He's got an incoherent source of consolation. Um, and uh, anyway, so um, I think that's another kind of when you, uh, these comparisons to non-existing, your personal non-existence, you're contingent. But then you realize where everything around you seems to be contingent. It might not have existed. The earth need not have existed. Um, just about everything individually is just contingent. It, it is not a necessary being. But then it seems to be possible that none of it existed. Uh, and that, that there'd be an empty world, right? Uh, one is, uh, there's an article called a subtraction argument uh, by uh, I think Tom Baldwin. Uh, and you start out, you know, consider uh, the actual world and then consider another possible world where there's like one less thing, what, like my spectacles aren't there. And then go to another possible world in which, you know, my watch, you know, isn't there and, you know, keep on going. And then eventually, whittle things down. And you get down to three things, then two things, then one thing. And then finally, to nothing. And then the question arises, 
why is there something, at least one thing, rather than nothing at all? And then you don't seem to have any resource to answer that question because the normal way you explain it, like how my spectacles came into existence is, well, the people, you know, uh, at the eye glass place, they made the spectacles and it was like seen and they could turn it impressively into this glass and blah, blah. There was something earlier, I keep on, where did the seeing come from? Well, go to the geology story, you know, and keep on going. Um, but if it turned out that there was, I mean, I, the way I try to show anything exists, I find some other contingent thing and show it exists. But then you can keep on pressing, well, what, what about that? So, I, okay. But more tellingly, the problem is you can't, with the alternative where there's nothing at all. Um, why is it that there's at least some of those contingent things rather than none of them? And that's the question of why is there something rather than nothing? Which uh, Martin Heidegger, uh, said it was the fundamental, you know, a principle, the deepest problem in metaphysics, um, which is really an interesting example, I thought, because um, generally metaphysics is pretty complicated. There are all kinds of things. Or are there these platonic entities, you know, or these kind of, you know, or, you know, is everything material, you know, and then like this thing is so simple, right? You just sort of just have a, a zero case. It's the simplest possible situation. Uh, and it's a, a deep metaphysical. So that's one way I think people get into the nothingness stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that's the big scale, nothing. But I also think they get, you know, there are other ways, but that's, that's the big one. Right. Like sometimes I, like, I would wonder, are we sort of asking the right questions? Is lang natural language deceiving us in one way? Like even, even just using an expression like contingent and necessary being or, and, and getting model logic involved in the way we're thinking like sometimes and it happens in philosophy we are sort of going into a dark sort of tunnel with <laughs> no no ending really so uh -huh. I, I do often really wonder if, if we're if, if there's anything of that sort going on here are you careful are you work you know is this something you you know considering yeah uh, so i think that's the dominant reaction people have to it they say hold on just as dawkins was giving us a kind of mistaken model of what's going on. Like there are the, all these many non-existent people running around because that doesn't even seem to make any sense. How can there be lots of non-existent people? Because you're saying there exists non-existent people. That's just contradictory, right? So reel it back and, and, and check your presuppositions. You know, um, it might be emotionally engaging. Like when the, in, and it may be like, so uh, Wittgenstein, they, they're just gobsmacked by this question. You know, why is there something rather than nothing? And they're, whoa, even like hardened people like Arthur Schopenhauer, he's like, wow, that's a deep one, you know? Uh, but then you're there thinking, oh, hold on. Uh, maybe I've got the wrong model of what's going on. So um, I think there are a number of people who uh, think that there's a, it's a pseudo question. And maybe that isn't even the most popular way of under, trying to get out of, if you're going to try to get out of it. So some people, so Schopenhauer says, it's a real question, it's a real riddle, and no, there's no answering it. Uh, William James, same story. People who are generally suspicious, maybe of our psychologies, a lot of them are, well, this is a real one. Um, but that doesn't exhaust all the people. It doesn't exhaust, for example, you're a little suspicious, I think. Um, and you might think, well, maybe I made some, I've set this thing up the wrong way. Um, maybe the idea that there could be an empty world is not a genuine possibility. So, so, so for example, some people think of um, a, uh, a possible world is sort of like a, a, a kind of an object, a, a large object, you know, so there's like, so there's, you, set, you generally think of, you know, the eyeglasses and the, and the, and the watch is like two separate things, but there's also maybe the fusion of the two, you know, considered together. Um, and then you could say maybe the world is just like the largest fusion of things. And if you have that picture of what a world is as a massive object that's or a fusion of objects, uh, the, the, uh, then the, big the biggest object, um, well, then there always has to be something. So uh, that's one model. Um, and then, um, 
there's, um, yeah, so some people don't like the subtraction argument uh, because they think, uh, no, there's a principal stopping point. You can get it down to one, but you can't go to zero. Um, you can, um, uh, it's tempting to think you can go down to zero because um, in math, it is an empty set. Uh, so it seems like you, when you're modeling these things in terms of sets, mm. you know, and so what happens is some philosophers will then say, well, no, there is no such thing as the empty set. So Jonathan Lowe, it's a, it could be a kind of a fiction, uh, convenient for mathematicians. But what a set is, after all, remember how they defined it? Uh, the set's defined in terms of its members. Yeah. So when you get to a situation where there are no members, well, wait a minute, that's now something different. Uh, maybe you can get a kind of jolly things along by assuming, oh, suppose they were one, a kind of fake, a dummy thing, you know? And that's how he thinks that would happen. We get kind of, um, our mathematicians get a little mesmerized by the technical tricks you can perform with the empty set. But basically, Lowe says, there's no real empty set. It's just like talking about the average mean or something like that, a good technical trick or, or the center of gravity of a person. It's just an, a device. Uh, it's a strange. You know, if you start taking it seriously, then it's it's kind of weird because the, the the you know it can do things like it goes outside your body. You know, like you can you bend over a certain way to explain why you tend to topple is that your center of gravity is no longer inside your body, or if you're jumping over you know with these high jump things, you curl your body along. <laughs> the, your center of gravity flows underneath the bar. <laughs> things like. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> but you don't really want to believe there's this mysterious object. The, anyway, so you might think uh, maybe we have to uh, uh, take uh, the empty set with a grain of salt and we can't really model things in terms of sets this way, in the way that the subtraction argument wants. Um, I mean, everybody, there are other people, like, uh, so Robert Nozick and, um, and uh, Peter von Ingwagen uh, thought that you actually, there's a, a statistical argument in favor of there being something rather than nothing, uh, which is a charming argument. And the idea is um, there's only one empty world, but there are infinitely many, infinitely many worlds in which there's at least one thing in it. So uh, the odds are you know, that they would have to be something rather than nothing. The chance of there being an empty world is zero. <laughs> Because there's infinitely many things in it, you see? Yeah. It's like a lottery with infinitely many tickets. It isn't impossible. It's just that the probability would be zero in the strange way that zero works in an infinite context. So I thought that was a clever, but there they are taking it seriously. And they, they're claiming that they can answer it. So that's a different maneuver. Uh, so there's a division of opinion. Um, uh, scientists are... Um, what they tend to do is like change the meanings of the question. So it will make it approachable, approachable by their, so some of them claim to answer the question. Why is there something rather than nothing? Um, what they do is they, uh, they, they talk about uh, like, there's a lot of uh, what's called a vacuum, you know, in physics is like actually plenty going on. <laughs> Things are just sort of zipping in and out of um, uh, from a, a state in which, it's just sort of uh, energy to matter, blah, 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 pop in and out. Um, and so you could, um, uh, you could have uh, a scenario which you're envisioning where there aren't any things in this, in, in this what we might want to call a material thing. <laughs> like, uh, but there's plenty of other stuff. And then it will pop in, you know, and then you, anyway, so uh, some people, um, uh, you know, cl claim they can eat. But it looks like that doesn't seem to persuade any philosophers. They, they think, no, the, the energy, what we need, that would be something. So that's not going to work. Um, and so, uh, mm -hmm. anyway, so they, they sometimes talk that way, but I don't really think that they uh, for, are uh, keeping the terminology as the original question is posed, mm -hmm. which I think is pretty well, the philosophers do a pretty good job. What they mean is, why are there any concrete objects? And they, by concrete, they mean has a position in space and time or space, or at least one of the two. <laughs> maybe, from, maybe mental events don't have any spatial uh, location, but maybe they, they still have a, a temporal uh, location. That's what they mean. Why are there, um, that's how they kind of precisify things. 
uh, why are there any material, uh, why are there any concrete things? That's the, and that, uh, that, those are kind of the rules of the game for how they kind of address the question. So they set aside, for example, whether they are abstract objects like numbers. Or law, that, they're law not interested in that. Yeah. yeah, those would be necessary beings. You know, if they, if they exist, so, mm-hmm. uh, but that's not what we're interested in. That's not what gets us all God with the question. You know? the, we're interested in the concrete things. Yeah, well, well, now that, that you've said that, I think this is how sort of this was the debate also going on in the sort of middle the the mid ages in between sort of Islamic philosophers and theologians and guys who were into theology defending sort of Islamic theology and that sort of thing. And, you know, they were claiming that, yes, um, creation was out of nothing. And philosophers denied that because it's, it's, it is isn't an impossibility. Something can't come out of nothing. Nothing is nothing. It's not a substance. So they had to, on the, they had to say that the world is in some way, some sense, old. It's, it's not created out of nothing. And then, obviously, they were, you know, chastised for it because it's denying something that is um against the sort of the superficial um obvious meaning of the text and um so not not another thing sort of when thinking about abstract things so for example the law of non-contradiction i don't think that just goes beyond me whether i exist or not exist and we have this ability to sort of conceive things as if they exist without us without us sort of we have an, an amazing you know uh, imagination you know to imagine things what would have what you know imagine sort of counterfactual things and things of that sort and i think that's how this sort of um th- this might be the original sort of phenomenology of the problem of nothingness and questions related to it like necessary beings and uh, contingent beings and things of that sort and and this is how, as i think you know it you know that this is how th- um, philosophers tend to try to prove the existence of God, that God is the necessary being and God is equivalent to being, you know, that's, it is the, that's, that's the essence and all but God is just a contingent being. Yeah. So I wonder if, if you have any, uh, comments on that. Well, yeah. So I, um, you got a lot going on in that question. Uh, so it is, it does seem to be the, um, this idea of an appreciation of how contingent things are seems to be more salient um, uh, in Islam. That's my Western impression uh, from than it is. I mean, it, they had some they had been sales, salients in early Christianity with um, Augustine, but it doesn't seem to be the same way. So. Um, my impression, you know, and, and this is just an outsider looking in, is uh, there's more uh, awareness that it has to be, uh, is this kind of um, dependency uh, on a, a deity uh, that is a more, yeah, it's kind of more at the surface of consciousness than it is in the, um, and uh, it's only sort of by the will uh, of this, this deity that things are as they are and so it's just and you're constantly reminded of it you know god willing yeah mm-hmm. uh so um whereas you know there's a kind of uh, uh it, you know my impression is the western conscious is like it's just there's a more of a division this sort of there's a, a secular a secularization that's as a stronger hold so on Sundays, <laughs> you might say things like that. <laughs> but once you're out of church and you're hitting the parking lot and you're driving, <laughs> you don't really, you know, you're you're kind of, you know, you're motoring along as an atheist. <laughs> you know, you're you're just it doesn't make that much impact. You're not really thinking too much about it. You know, it's o- it's only like in the special moments. It isn't there's not a kind of as much of a, a general. <laughs> culture you know appreciation of just that level of contingency independence now the the, the thing i guess the, the the question off for the people is once you if you make it once you uh were to uh drop out a necessary being things become more mysterious 
And I think that's part of the attraction of the cosmological argument. Like, look, if you drop that out, you would be left with this explanatory hole that you cannot fill. Um, and it's, uh, I suspect that's why Schopenhauer is like one of the early open atheists. Is he's there saying, well, uh, there is this big hole and it will never be filled by anyone because it's an unfillable hole, but it's a hole. <laughs> um, so, um, I mean, you can, I mean, there are ways you can, uh, so Aristotle, um, uh, thought that it was an infinite past that, you know, there, you ask, you know, which came first, the chicken or the egg, Aristotle? Uh, bad question, says Aristotle. There's always been chickens, always been eggs. There's no first egg and there's no first chicken. Okay. Very tidy, Aristotle. So that's an infinite pianist. Um, yeah. Um, so um, under that, you could have, under that model, you could have an infinite sequence of contingent beings. So this is one of the things that has to be handled in these debates on the cosmological arguments. A scenario in which you have all contingent beings uh, infinitely back, but there's no necessary being. Why not that one? Is that, um, because it, um, although each thing would have its own little explanation, there would be no explanation of the whole thing. So someone who, who, who believes, so the, this question, why is there something rather than nothing? Could be answered. Could be an, uh, a serious question still asked after they became persuaded that there's an infinite past, um, and but it's all contingent beings without any necessary being because they can't explain the whole thing. Uh, someone like David Hume will be telling you, well, uh, all the explanation that there really is is from one contingent being to another contingent being, and then you maybe it's like meaningless or something <laughs> that's not very convincing but i think that's all he's got really there it's, doesn't make any sense to ask over the whole thing uh, but that seems to be certainly our strong tendency you're not satisfied you're inquisitive so well, what about the whole thing <laughs> what's responsible for that and so people who keep on pressing the cosmological argument say you still need it you know the necessary being uh, it doesn't have to be a necessary being that was in time that started it all it can just be a uh, uh, kind of this metaphysical necessity of their, that there can't be any contingent beings without there being a necessary being. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are like, yeah, well, we talked about nothing at a big, big scale. So um, actually what, what got me uh, with that book is I was, I became interested in nothings at the small scale. That so was interesting. Uh, our um, uh, perception of shadows. Uh, so you have an absence of light. And I was impressed that we can see them um, because they didn't seem to conform. If it's just an absence, you say, then what is the thing that you're seeing? It's, a, uh, it's kind of puzzling. It also seems maybe problematic that, well, how usually I see things because they cause me to have certain experiences, visual experiences, but it's an absence. How does this absence cause anything? Um, so the um, so the, what I was impressed by is that um, it seemed uh, that um, familiar theories of perception would seem to imply you couldn't see shadows, but they plainly, we do see them. And so uh, I wanted to, uh, yeah. uh, so this uh, book called uh, Seeing Dark Things is all about, it starts out with that, but I'm also interested in how you see holes, for example. Uh, this, that's where there's an absence of matter, <laughs> so, but it looks like you can see them. Uh, you can count them, like there are holes on your the handout that you make or something. Um, so they yet there's uh, counterexamples of materialism. <laughs> That's how it began. Uh, David Lewis and Stephanie Lewis had a dialogue in which they uh, present it in that context. Easy counterexamples of materialism that you can see holes that the holes exist. Um, and so you can have these nothings at a small scale. And then um, you can kind of scale up. Um, so, and indeed the history of thought uh, follows some of this. Um, the, um, the resistance to nothing uh, is pretty strong um, in Western thinking. That is the dominant, 
And the first breach is really um, with the atomists because the atomists, well, actually it's Democritus. Uh, it has to be a certain kind of atomism. There were some people like even Plato speculated that it might be just everything's filled up with atoms, but no empty spaces between them. Um, but then the, uh, the kind of atomism that became um, dominant uh, uh, rejected that. They said, well, there also has to be this empty space that the little particles can you know, move around in and so forth. Um, and that's an, uh, actually, and so Aristotle incidentally is uh, just horrified by this because um, you're affirming the non-being, this, this, this nothingness. Um, you're picturing the universe, there's, the, there's, there's nothing, and then there's a few, these atoms, you know. And then, uh, and then what happens incidentally is um, people become pretty clever at explaining things just in terms of fewer atoms and more emptiness. <laughs> and so the, the models, the atomist models become ever more spare of the ever fewer atoms yeah. <laughs> in, the, in the region. And um, the, the emptiness gets sort of gets more and more dominant uh, along this line of thinking. Um, so um, that view uh, uh, is a persistent uh, drumbeat in the background, um, but was like everybody hates it uh, <laughs> because it's associated with um, atheism and hedonism. And so, the, and so the Christians for a very long time resisted. Um, but eventually, <laughs> I mean, they really needed though, because <laughs> they wanted to defend why is there something rather than nothing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so eventually, um, after a few false starts, uh, it's, they get basically um, uh, sold on it. So with Isaac Newton, so uh, he building on some earlier unsuccessful efforts to integrate um, atomism, uh, he got it uh, kind of accepted. They had to be like a huge propaganda industry, incidentally, to get this going. You had to maintain that those, uh, you know, the Epicurus and Democritus, they'd stolen really uh, the idea from Moses or something. <laughs> Sounding rewrite of history to make it seem acceptable for a Christian to hold. <laughs> uh, so they rewrite history sufficiently. And so um, then they get, a, they get intellectual responsibility, respectability for the question of why there's something rather than nothing because it looks like physics has just blessed it. Uh, and that gives you good rational credentials. And then, anyway, you have that, but um, not, you know, it's, I think current physics is hostile to, to nothingness because what they give you is a vacuum that's like loaded with energy. <laughs> it's, it's, not what, it's not what, it's not the, the so they, you know, with, with Newton, you wind up with uh, absolute space, which is sort of, a giant nothing. <laughs> um, uh, so that was, anyway, so I think that's part of what's interesting in the book is going through this, the longs up and downs of the nothingness. Um, I think currently we're in a down for nothingness as far as physics is concerned, even though nominally it's, it looks like they're talking about vacuums and so on, but because they've gotten rid of absolute space uh, uh, pretty um, dramatically in with relativity theory. Uh, the philosophers are, are not, they have a lot more affection for it still. Uh, they don't really see how you can get rid of it. I think common sense is all into, they, common sense likes absolute space. <laughs> um, and physics will probably, physics probably agree. <laughs> so much for common sense. <laughs> with their view of it. <laughs> yeah. uh, but it's, um, anyway, so that's the, so the, the basic, the, the, how the book goes is, um, is this these ups and downs of nothingness? Uh, nothing on a big scale, nothing on a small scale, uh, and uh, yeah. So I, I, um, uh, I think it's a, a cross cultural sort of thing. That was the other thing that really struck me. Mm. Um, that at about the same time, about the fifth century BC, you have like three different philosophical, three different civilizations, three philosophical civilizations um, converge on asking the question. Uh, it, it happens in uh, in the Dallas in China um, with uh, Buddhism, and then in the Greeks at about the same time. But there's no connection between the two. They're not like 
sending emails back and forth. <laughs> yeah. They, they seem to sort of like clockwork turn from all this interest into what is the case to what is not the case. It's very manifestations. So the Chinese philosophy is very practical and uh, it's interested in omissions, the power of not doing things uh, and whether uh, you can, uh, can that have, uh, the, you know, physical consequences can control things through omissions, you know, are there, and they, they start to think, yeah, you can. And indeed that's the way, that's the wise way to do things. You're not acting and they can become very subtle uh, in that. Um, and then in, in Buddhism, uh, there's, uh, uh, I also think there's, uh, uh, another uh, term where they just, they don't think that you could, like I talked about, it seems kind of artificial that this would be an object, the, you know, the, the watch. <laughs> That's also one object, but they're not. Anyway, in Buddhism, what happens is that you might think that the spectacles are, well, that's one object at least. But in Buddhism, you're skeptical about whether there are any um, uh, holes uh, in the sense of there being a whole object. There, there are parts, there are basic parts, but they never collect into a whole. So all there are are the individual atoms, um, some of them mental, some of them physical at first with Buddha, and they never actually form anything. It's just fictions. So my spectacles are a fiction. Um, mm. And so um, when, uh, when, I, when they, my spectacles get crushed or they seem to go out of existence, really nothing went out of existence. And, um, and there's some solace that they're offering. Um, so they do existing things, but there are no, they're no holes. There are no, it isn't, you know, it's just the opposite of um, in China. Every, China things are holism is very dominant there. You know, the, the whole is like more real than the parts. In Buddhism is just all they are just the parts. They never form any holes. It's all fictions that are created, including uh, the person, you know, you who seem to be suffering so much. You're not real. Now that's generally a hard sell. <laughs> but that's 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 what's going to be sold uh, by Buddhism. You're gonna get, we're gonna have you relax. Uh, you're not, you're not going to die because you're not here. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's, um, it's an amazing, um, so, so there, there's nothing in the sense there are no, there are no composite things. That's the, the, the nothingness aspect. Generally it pays to relativize when people are talking about nothing, nothing in what way there are no composite things or there's no action. There's just omission or there's no, you kind of modify uh, that with kind of nothing you're talking about. Yeah. Like with, with Heidegger, he would, you know, he would talk about nothingness. Like, like, a, like we all, so there was like a division. Like some of us were like amazed by this question and others were, who were like very skeptical. Like we yeah. should learn to like talk properly that that's the, how derogatory we were, you know, towards him. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I mean, you can, I mean, you can, um, there's a strong tendency. I, um, I think mostly you should, when people use the word nothing, they generally do mean it in some sort of relativized way. You know, if I, if you, you know, what's in your refrigerator, you say nothing. Yeah. I mean, um, then it could be, you just mean there's no, no food items in there, you know, that you're cleaning out your refrigerator for some reason or something like that. Um, that's how you, it's some sort of, there's a context, there's a universe of discourse and just pointing out there's none of the items that you might expect are in there. Or, or, or that's the, the population zero of the, in the question. But I think that you can make out um, another way of, you get closer to the absolute nothingness uh, when you are thinking, why is there something rather than nothing? You're thinking, it's still relativized, I think. What it means like, couldn't there be um, no concrete things? That gives you something pretty close to what people were interested in. Uh, and I think that one um, is a meaningful question. Uh, you have, I, it's a long discussion, but uh, you don't have to view the nothingness as an object, uh, which seems to be. So Heidegger does think of it as sort of, he's thinking um, you are um, emotionally engaged with it, mm. uh, that you are. Uh, so the, the way he's understanding, I think, uh, free-floating anxiety is um, 
I, you know, why am I anxious? I don't, I, so what am I worried about? I don't have anything to worry about, yet I find myself anxious. A high degree has an interpretation uh, suggested by Kierkegaard uh, that it's just your awareness, uh, your, it's, it's the nothingness. Um, just like Heidegger thinks that uh, when you're bored, that's actually a metaphysically insightful state, which you're perceiving as time. Um, so um, when you're, um, and then the, this there's uptake by uh, Sartre. Uh, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre uh, thinks of, uh, when he brings in nothingness, he is thinking of, um, uh, he has a, 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 a somewhat objectifying, you know, way he does it. So he's thinking, so it, when he's talking about uh, one of his characters is in a park and kind of playing the chestnut tree, you know, and, and, the, and the, he's, he's really basically thinking about these um, entities as uh, they're contingent. And he's also thinking of the world as like overstuffed with stuff. <laughs> so he's, it's, a, it's a, a thought that I think is more appropriate to Schopenhauer. Schopenhauer is a very pessimistic guy. Yeah. And he thinks like there's too much stuff. You know, it's like uh, you, you can hardly turn around. Just, and because the, the stuff that exists that's bad exists is a big mistake for Schopenhauer. Uh, and, and you get some of that impression with Sartre. It's he's sort of channeling. Um, he thinks there's too much things, too much existing things. It's just sort of overwhelming and cloying. Um, so um, um, uh, he, I know he's pretty good at kind of a literary way of kind of bringing out the emotional signs, the phenomenology, there being too much stuff. Um, and maybe uh, maybe explaining the opposite reaction you sometimes have. Of, um, you look out at a desert. It can be beautiful. It's very puzzling. Why should that seem to be beautiful? If you're evolved as a hunter-gatherer, and so it doesn't make any sense. This should be like a horror show to you. The desert. I'm going to die in the desert. That's terrible. It should be ugly and terrible. But many people look at a desert and it's, it can be beautiful. Um, and um, the idea is, well, maybe less stuff. <laughs> and you develop your, your tests, your, your tastes for uh, desert landscapes or something. Anyway, so... Um, uh, I think people are emotionally engaged with it. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's kind of all over the place. It's a practice with nothingness. The kind of confusions that you're concerned about, I think those are, those are real, that the people are, there's that. But I don't really think those kind of get rid of all the, the questions. I think a lot of high digger can be rescued. Um, um, he, he does speak incautiously uh, and uh, in a strange way often, you know. But it, and some of it is meaningless, <laughs> but not all of it's meaningless. It's, it's pretty recoverable, I think. You know? Yeah. Why? Like, why questions of that sort are always probably even impossible really to answer. Like, I, I, like, um, like even in principle, I can't think what would even a hypothetical answer look like. You know, that's <laughs> a, that's a problem. Yeah. So. Um, so some people do want to say, if, if I can't picture what an answer would be like, then it's a, a meaningless question. And so that's why they kind of get intrigued with um, the Von Ingwag and, and Nozick answer, the statistical answer, because it looks like, yeah, I'm allowing, I can picture it, but I also get an explanation. It's just overwhelming. I, it's the same sort of explanation of why are you now alive? Um, because there's a chance that all the oxygen in the room that you're right now could be off in one, one corner. And yet uh, here you are happily breathing, you know, and the idea is, well, the odds were in your favor for continuing. Uh, and in that sense, that's the explanation is because it's, there's so many more situations in which the oxygen's well uh, distributed in the room. Right. And the, so with this, in the same sense of why we can explain why you can breathe, we can explain why there is something rather than nothing. So that one, like, that's, I think, part of what's intriguing about their story is that you're not forced to say, I can't make sense of it. I think I, I even get an explanation, you know. Mm. Um, but many other people think, um, you know. So we, it's interesting in the case of Schopenhauer, because he does insist it's impossible to answer it. But he's, and he's often very dismissive of our ability to think about philosophy. 
you know, we're just a bunch of, you know, apes not designed to do this way above. We're just, you know, the brain is just a servant of your gonads, you know, just out of reproduction. And why would you think we'd be able to have any success with these things? He, and so, he, you know, he shall you with all these insults to our intelligence. <laughs> and yet, hold on for this question. This is a genuine question. Um, now, you still might be suspicious. You might think, well, boy, he loves a horror show. And he wants to make sure that the horrible mistake of existence is there for, a, for aesthetic purposes of his philosophies. Uh, and I think that kind of suspicion as you're reading Schopenhauer is a good suspicion as you're reading him. Uh, the way he kind of conducts, you know, is so successful in a literary way because of the aesthetic value of the philosophy. It's a horror show. <laughs> and it's just pretty funny, one horror following another horror. <laughs> uh, but that's a terrible way of really trying to assess anything, you know, and uh, correctly appraise how good things are. <laughs> Yeah. you know for i mean it's a good comedy <laughs> yeah uh, but it's it's not a very good way to, uh so uh anyway um i guess yeah so i guess i, I mostly think the questions uh so some of them veer off into meaninglessness uh the fact that you can't envisage how you, it could be answers uh, i i don't think that's actually a good test for meaninglessness though i mean i just should appreciate what Mm -hmm. These are all the resources I have. Yeah. And then, um, um, and usually those are enough to answer things. And I tend to think about questions where I do have the resources. Yeah. But sometimes yeah. I don't. Um, yeah. And that's what we learn, you know, by various kinds of limit results. Yeah. I think, I think you're right about that. Yeah. I don't have any resources and I shouldn't really jump to the conclusion that, you know, it's a meaningless I don't think, I don't think, I don't think it is, it is a meaningless question. I think we could, I could legitimately say that, you know, at, like after I die, there is nothing, and then I could I could elaborate and say, okay, why nothing? I mean, there is no, so I'm not going to be conscious to experience something, and there's the opposite of that. Because so yeah, th there is something, whatever it may be, there might there might there is something. I could envisage the universe heading slowly but slowly but surely towards annihilation. Okay, so there the the, the, the amount of planets are get, are getting reduced, reduced, reduced until there is nothing now linguistically speaking it, it, it is as if i'm saying something so there is an object and then there is nothing and, but a, a a pure and so even even in the philosophical world and in the Islamic philosophy some of them even use the definite article so they would say the nothingness to describe such a state so absolute total nothing so like so even in terms of pred predication they would say just sh say nothing total silence nothing that i can I, I do have sufficient imagination to imagine that but nothing really to say about it or even entertain do thoughts experiments with it really so what do you think about yeah um well i think there are problems in trying to picture um it as um picking out a peculiar thing the nothingness i think you can make sense of what people are driving at they might think could you have a space in which there were no concrete things? I think Isaac Newton was doing that. Uh, that's how he thought that things had actually unfolded. He thought that there was an infinite past and there just weren't any particles, any atoms at all. Then after all this infinite stuff has gone by, uh, gone, you know, uh, well, now let's see. Okay. Well, now, now <laughs> let's, let's create some stuff. Uh, and then, um, the, you know, uh, this, this incidentally bothered uh, uh, St. Augustine. Well, it bothered the early Christians because it looked like you'd have that model. Like, what was God doing before he created the world? And then uh, the Christians in uh, Augustine's time would say, making hell for people who ask that question. <laughs> uh, but in the case of uh, Newton, he just says, well, you know, he had his divine reasons for choosing this time. I mean, it seems bad because it's completely arbitrary. It's just got yeah, nothing yeah. to anchor it on. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And just God, say, oh, it's, you know, I don't know, really, but God, it must have had some reason like, like that time. And then what happens is like, well, now his, is it within last, like, you know, uh, that, that was around 4004 BC about. 
studying for the genealogies. And then here we are. And um, and then we not, we're not going to last that long because uh, Newton was reading the book of Revelations. <laughs> Mm-hmm. and uh, forecasting um, an end. Uh, so, um, so um, anyway, I, I, I think I, I, I kind of picture the, the Newton and that was absolute space. I think I can picture absolute space. And uh, that seemed to, once you ask that question, well, why, you know, why did it start at this moment is a, is a good question. Uh, and um, so if you, generally you take, if it looks like they want to have, it pick out a, a certain kind of object that is pretty problematic so you know my general policy is to try to find something else they're interested in that they actually do mean to be using the word as a quantifier word it's telling it's zero something and then i want to find well what are they zeroing out um so um maybe they're zeroing out concrete objects or something uh and i think then you can kind of start making 